chartered accountants, what steps we have taken um, to integrate sustainability into our own operations and what resources we have provided for our members for on their own sustainability journey. So moving on, we have built sustainability into our values and many of you might be familiar with strategy 2024, which is our vision to build a more sustainable profession and institute in all aspects of our work. We've got five core ideals and these are underpinned by the message for tomorrow for good. And I wanted to show a very quick video. And this video talks about our strategy, strategy 24. This should be going live now. Okay, it, the message of Strategy 24 is connecting and empowering and allowing us to be at the forefront of ethical thought leadership and sustainability and really improving our members' ability to deal with this change and the uncertainty that Strategy 2020 is all about, but it is is like That really sums up where we are with our strategy 24 and what this means to us and describing our strategy in one slide uh, is our vision and values our purpose and our strategic priorities but it's really just the strategic priorities that i wanted to focus on this evening and there's three of those in particular the connecting the empowering and the evolving which gives us a frame for how we define sustainability which is under environment social and economic and governance wraps around those three pillars. So under the environment pillar, what we're focusing on is increasing capacity among our members to promote the agenda of sustainability. And we do that by including content in our publications that ranges from our podcasts, our Accountancy Ireland magazine, and also discrete individual publications that we do just on sustainability. We also have treated sustainability as a subject in our events, both district society events and also national events and, and international events but the the national events last year were focused on the public sector and also on topics like esg reporting and access to sustainability finance and we also took part in events like climate finance week so we're really trying to promote the, the the voice of accountants and our membership in this area. We also are increasing capacity among our students. So for the first time last year, sustainability was included as a core topic at FAE level. And the most recent issue of the bottom line, which is our student magazine focused entirely on sustainability and with a particular focus on the new jobs that will be in this field and what skills accountants are going to need and to take this on. We also are increasing our own network. Our global network would include, say, the Global Accounting Alliance. And I sit on the Sustainable Expert Working Group of that organization. And through that, we connect into bodies like Accounting for Sustainability. We're also going to be part of the UN Global Compact, Chartered Accountants Worldwide, and One Young World. And in this way, we're able to bring international experience back to the Institute and then out to our members. We're also working on our own institute environmental plan this year. So under social, we have say multiple entry points to the profession, including the flexible working route. We've got CA support to support our members and our students. We have many activities around charity and health. I've only mentioned a couple there because there's, there's so many. And we're also very much a business in the community. So we take part in pride events. We're judges for the Enactus competition. We take part in culture night. And you may, some people on the call may have been into the building when we do that and we do uh, tours of our art collection, for instance. We're part of International Women's Day. And under economic, it's worthwhile pointing out that as an institute, 
we are the chartered accountants contribute 1.5 billion to the economy on and the, to society on the island of Ireland every year. And we know that because we commissioned Oxford Economics last year to put a monetary value on this contribution. And that's the, the figure that they, they were able to find. We also are growing every year. So it's not surprising that we have this kind of level of contribution in society. And we're at all levels, or chartered accountants are at all levels of the economy, both private and public and also in not-for-profit organizations so we're at the trainee level there but all the way uh, up to say ministers so are the current minister for um it's public public expenditure department of public expenditure and reform and um, is a chartered accountant as is the junior minister for finance so the the reach of chartered accountants is great and so sustainability it makes sense for us to understand more about sustainability so this network can be empowered to, to promote it through the economy however this is how we understand sustainability for many people coming to it for the for the first time it looks much more like this you know, it's this alphabet soup of acronyms, of principles and guides and standards. And um, I've got to say the TCFD, the disclosures, and it just makes people panic. So what we wanted to do in the Institute was provide guides for accountants specifically, but also for other finance professionals on how you understand and how you interpret sustainability for your business. So we define it for us as meaning resilience and future-proofing your business and meeting the Brundtland Commission definition of satisfying today's needs without compromising future generations' ability to meet their needs. So in this publication that you can see there, um, it's appearing on our, on our online hub. In this publication, we define sustainability and what that means, but also provide guides of how people implement it in their own organizations, what myths exist around sustainability and how they can be they can be addressed and, and challenged. So what you're looking at on this screen are slides or screenshots from the Sustainability Centre. So this is a resource, although it's in our Knowledge Centre on the website, it's free for everybody and anybody can access it and download the content there and share it. What we have here is on the left hand side, you can see the purple cover there is the, the publication Sustainability for Accountants. In the middle slide, there's more information about sustainability and what it is, and the backgrounds, more information about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And on the, the right picture there is a picture of our resources that have compiled to help members. So among those, we have global resources, that's from organizations like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We've got resources from the big four accounting firms. We've also got interviews with sustainability leaders in the profession, not just accountants or chartered accountants, but also leaders in business. So for example, there's an interview there with David McRedmond, who is the CEO of OnPost, which has got a very good sustainability presence and profile. There's also a glossary there of the many terms and acronyms that were shown on the previous slide. And as an institute, on behalf of our members, we respond to consultations and we've got these included here. And also, finally, we've got information there about, um, sorry, something's covering there. I should, I should obviously know this at the top of my head and I do, but sometimes when you're doing a presentation, you can kind of, you almost forget what's on your own slides. But there's a lot of information there for accountants that is um, of great use. So I'd urge everybody to have a look at that and use that. Here's a quick uh, snapshot of all the events that were there last year. And these can be found actually in the, the, the piece that um, I was just about to refer to there in the previous slide. It's in the podcast webinars and articles. And what this is, is are collections of recordings of all of the webinars that we've done on this space. They can, you can go back in and look at those at any time. Next year, this is my final slide. We've got a lot more information about the, um, the Institute's environmental plan, where we aim to show leadership by organizing our own. Uh, we do an awful lot of work already, but this, this year is the year to kind of to, to really define this and to connect it with our strategy and to demonstrate how we're using metrics and targets to, to, to reach our goals. Where we're applying for membership of the UN Global Compact, which is a, volunt a voluntary network of CEOs who are looking to embed the principles throughout their organizations of sustainability. And finally, this year is the first year we're having Sustainability Week, which is a week long program of events that will show publications on, for instance, decarbonization and biodiversity for accountants. And also, we have a sustainability conference on the 16th of June, which it has um, under the, the, the banner of people, profit, and planet, the, the triple bottom line. 
and there's an international conference on June the 17th connecting our members in Canada and in New York and in London where we'll talk about ESG and finance again and also future skills of accountants. So keep in touch and keep an eye on the website and also in the e-newsletter. And you can connect with me at any time on the Chartered Accountant website. And I've also put my contact details there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to my colleague, my, um, my, my contact there, John Barcroft, and I'll mute myself. And John, if you want me, just say next slide and I'll go through your slides in this presentation, okay? Thank you, Susan. So uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to join you in your session on sustainability. Uh, I've always found sustainability a, a bit of a tricky word to use. Uh, it often means different things to different people, but the best, uh, the best advice I can possibly give is to, uh, instead of thinking about your business as uh, doing great sustainability, to think about your business as, uh, as a great sustainable business. Uh, and, and to be a sustainable business, of course, you need to be profitable, but you also need to look after a number of non-financial factors which come under those headings that Susan mentioned of economic, environmental and social. Uh, and regardless of the topic that you're going to focus on under, in, uh, under those categories, uh, it's important to think about, uh, you know, being um, uh, uh, lots of integrity around it and lots of rigor and, and transparency on what you're going to report. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to take a, a whistle-stop tour through three different uh, areas, the first being measurement, the second being risk, and the third being strategy. And all of those apply to any business or any industry, big or small, local or international, the principles are still the same. So let's start with measurement. And bearing in mind that this is uh, uh, mainly accountants on, on the call, uh, it's worth pointing out, you know, the measurement has very, a lot of similarities with financial accounting. Setting boundaries, putting in place processes, thinking about uh, auditability of the data, timeliness, conciseness, accuracy, completeness, all those principles that you'd be very familiar with in your own business when you're dealing with financial performance and financial metrics. The big difference, of course, is that you've got a new unit to think about apart from euros, pounds or dollars and that's tons of CO2 equivalent. T is for tons of CO2 is carbon dioxide, and the E is equivalent, and they have to use equivalent because carbon dioxide is not the only gas. It's not the only greenhouse gas. There are, there are other gases and there are families of gases which are represented in the top of that uh, diagram on the right-hand side. CO2 and CH4 methane are the biggest, but there are a few other specialty gases that appear, particularly refrigerants uh, and others in the chemical industry. But what's generally done in terms of accounting is that they are rebased or indexed against the CO2, and so you express it as tons of CO2 equivalent. How do you get your carbon footprint? Well, you manage and me you measure your energy data. And that's either, uh, it comes under three different categories according to the greenhouse gas protocol, which is the international standard for measuring carbon emissions. And it talks about scope, three scopes, one, two, and three. So I'll briefly touch on those. Um, we might have more detail on those later. But scope one are the fuels and energy that you use directly in your business, things that you can almost feel and touch. So it's liters of diesel, it's um, uh, tons of oil used for heating your facility or LPG, it's uh, cubic meters of natural gas if that's what you're using to heat your facility. And that's scope one. So it's things that you have operational and or financial control over. Scope two is a slightly unique one, and it's the electricity you use in your site that you pay for to power your lights and everything else in your facility. It's indirect because you're not actually generating the carbon emissions on your site, but they are being generated by the provider of that electricity, and the amount of emissions depends on the electricity you buy. Clearly, if you buy renewable electricity, the emissions are zero. Uh, if you're buying electricity generated by coal or oil, they're going to be much higher. The third scope is everything outside of your immediate control. So that is everything upstream and downstream of your activities. And they range from everything to the embedded carbon in your materials or in your buildings, to business travel, to the use of products if you sell them, to uh, transportation of your products and services, lots of things uh, in there, but they're not in your direct control, but you may have influence over them upstream and downstream. 
So that's measurement. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So risk management and, and you know, uh, climate risk management and risk management never sounds the most uh, exciting area, but really, if you're going to think about your climate change strategy or carbon strategy, you'll need to start first with the climate risk. And remembering, of course, risk has got two sides of that coin. There's the downside risk, which is the threats from climate change and the upside risk are the opportunities. And tends to be, I find that uh, most people, when they think of climate change, think of the downside a lot more than they think of the upside. But hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be more comfortable talking about upside risk from climate change, or this, it sounds uh, uh, slightly contradictory to be talking about upside from what is a, a very significant problem globally and nationally and locally of climate change. But if there's, if there's multi-trillion euros worth of risk, of, of downside risk, of threat, to uh, the economies of the world and locally, uh, then there must be the same equivalent as opportunities for businesses and organizations. So how do you assess what threats and opportunities are there for your business? Well, there are two broad categories of climate risk. Uh, go on to the next slide, please, Susan. Uh, and those are physical and transitional. Physical, I guess everybody's very familiar with, uh, and it's effectively the weather uh, on a slightly different time scale. Uh, and we can consider those risks as either acute, we're very familiar with this, with increased frequency and severity of extreme weather events, whether they are storms, freezing cold weather, high winds, uh, or droughts in some parts of the world. And they are, they are projected to increase uh, in frequency and severity as the years go on. And we're locked into that. No amount of reducing our carbon emissions is going to, um, is going to change that in the short term because the carbon is already in the atmosphere. So what are the pros and cons of, of that? Uh, you know, generally, that's going to be a downside threat for most uh, businesses and most industries, uh, unless you're in, of course, uh, uh, services and products that protect infrastructure or uh, prevent flooding or provide service around uh, mitigating those risks. The second one is chronic, and that's the longer term area. And that is probably more important in the area of um, uh, agriculture, uh, changing seasonal patterns, urban planning, if you're thinking about sea levels, if you're in a coastal location, and rising temperatures generally, and how that's going to impact on your supply chains or your own business uh, locally. So that's one side of it, physical. The other side is transitional, and that's transitional, that's transitioning to a low carbon economy. And this is happening as we speak. Uh, whether it's happening fast enough is a very debatable point. Probably the answer to that is no. But we are seeing it appearing in local policy, legal uh, and, and legal instruments, either coming from the EU or coming from our own government. Uh, they are carbon taxes. They are targets and metrics. They are energy efficiency requirements, labeling of products and services. So lots of policy and regulatory instrumentation is going to impact on your businesses either negatively or positively in the future. New technologies, new products and services are coming out to bring in and usher in that low carbon economy. You think of the automobile industry. There's a whole scale shift, of course, from fossil fuel burning to EV car, electric vehicles that is going to take place increasingly rapidly over time. Where they get the electricity is another question. But that whole industry is completely turned on its head and it's going to be the same for a lot of companies. So are your products and services going to be replaced by a different technology or are you going to provide the products and services that are going to be part of the solution for climate change? When we talk about markets, we're talking about raw materials or the resources you need to run your business. Where are they coming from? Will they still be available? Are they going to get more or less expensive as the impacts of climate change and the transition to a low carbon economy keep going. Um, with, with markets, it's also about changing consumer behavior and what are customers actually looking for, from you in terms of products and services, which leads us neatly into the fourth one, which is reputational. Uh, and really you're, you're seeing this probably already in your businesses that stakeholders and they can be employees, customers, regulators, investors, if you're a publicly traded company, are demanding more and more transparency, more and more information, more and more data from businesses and other organizations to demonstrate that they are taking climate change seriously and that they are putting in appropriate strategies and measuring the right things 
to be ready for this low carbon economy that's coming down the tracks. Okay, the next slide, please. So what's your climate strategy going to be? Well, that really depends on what your climate risks are. Uh, how do you uh, respond to the material risks that you have identified, either um, mitigating the downside risks, the threats, but also then seizing the opportunities that are out there to strengthen your business and make it a more sustainable business going forward. So it depends on the size of the risk, the degree of certainty you have around that risk. So it's very hard sometimes to project in the future and think about, well, what is that policy going to be in 10 years? What, how is technology going to develop? What products and services can I reasonably expect are going to be available or I can make available to customers? Are customers going to change their view of climate change? Maybe it's just a passing fad and then you know, the value the, the value proposition or the, the cost of what you produce becomes more important than its climate credential, shall we say. And then the time frames of those risks, if, the further you look out to see where those risks are, the more uncertainty is going to happen uh, be around those, those material risks. Now, next slide, please, on my last one, hopefully. That's great. So I wanted just to, to end on this and just to uh, uh, suggest that when you're thinking about climate, you really integrate it into your existing business processes. Uh, and given that the, the audience is particularly in, in the accountancy profession, I'll start at the right-hand side of capital allocation. So that's just a fancy term, of course, for you know, where are you going to invest your, your money? Um, and you need to make sure, of course, that you're going to invest it into uh, areas that are going to be sustainable in a low carbon economy and are going to protect your business from the physical impacts of climate change over the coming decades. How are you going to budget for carbon taxes, for an internal price of carbon, for increased costs associated with climate change? Because at the moment, there is very little internalization of the price of climate change. We do see it in a carbon tax. And in Ireland, it's currently 26 euros a ton. It's projected or is planned to go up to 80 euros a ton. How does that affect the cost of your electricity or the cost of your heating fuels? And what can you do to avoid that? New product development, products and services, how are you developing your products and services to be part of the solution to climate change? How are you looking at your supply chain to make sure that you're not exposed by where or what you're buying, uh, that, there are, that your own suppliers are not exposed to climate change and therefore let you down on a critical component or a critical service that you need to run your business. Operational resilience and efficiency on the left is all about uh, being, being as efficient as possible with the energy you consume and thus reducing your own carbon emissions and also being resilient. And, and Susan mentioned it very well in the definition of being a sustainable business, being resilient to the changes that are coming, either physical or in a transition. Finally, metrics and targets, or second to final, uh, metrics and targets. This is about your own carbon emissions, which I touched on at the very beginning, and how you measure those both in scope one, two, and three, but also metrics and targets about your new products. What percentage of your new products will have a green certification, or how can you show that they have been, uh, that they are carbon neutral, for instance? How much of your revenue is going to come from a greener product or a low carbon product in the future? And finally, ending on internal and external communications. Uh, and you will see a lot of, uh, you know, there's um, every company will now try to ensure that their communications has sustainability, sustainable, green, climate friendly, any of these terms associated with, with it. And, and that's absolutely correct. I'd sort of finish by slightly where I started is it's very important to maintain the integrity and rigor and transparency around those communications so you don't get caught out uh, with any accusations of greenwashing. Uh, so because the momentum for climate change and for producing this information uh, to your various stakeholders increasing, there is a, a potential pitfall of uh, over, overstating uh, the position that you have. So maintain the integrity, be robust about how you, you measure things and uh, make sure that you are transparent in what you're communicating in the future. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, John. And now I think we're handing over to Anya. 
Hello everyone and thanks very much for the opportunity to present to you this evening. Um, my name is Anya, I'm the HR and Purchasing Manager and the Green Team Manager at Hotel Doolan. We're located in the heart of Doolan near the Cliffs of Moor. Um, so Hotel Doolan is Ireland's only first and only certified carbon neutral hotel and uh, we were certified by a company called Green Hospitality and that's a picture of Doolan there. So we're located in the Burn and Cliffs of Moor Geopark. There's um, only two geoparks in the Republic of Ireland and uh, it's an area of unique geology. And um, so that's where our inspiration to start our green journey started um, to protect the environment and community where we're located. So we have a green team in the hotel um, we established the green team in 2012 and the three aims were to um, reduce the carbon footprint of the hotel, to improve our involvement with the community and to increase corporate social responsibility activities and purchase locally. And that's a picture of some of the team members on their first day at induction. And we have we cover a whole section at induction on sustainability so that we start the whole ethos from day one. Uh, so we have four cornerstones here. The first is a passion for delivering original and inventive food wherever possible using local, organic and homemade or homegrown ingredients. So 70% of our produce for Gloss Restaurant is purchased from a 50 kilometre radius of the hotel. We also have a polytunnel where we grow about 6,000 euro produce per year. Um, we deliver the very best hospitality at all, at all times by using our key service standards and these are things that we do all the time. And we um, are a leading contributor to our community and environment and we recognise that profitability is essential to our future success as a team. So being green and being carbon neutral isn't just good for the environment and for the community, it is actually good for the um, for the, the finance of the hotel. So obviously if we reduce our water consumption, we're reducing the cost of it, we reduce our waste, we're reducing the cost of it and energy at the same. So our three R's are to reduce, reuse and recycle and our three P's are people, planet and profit. So the green team is subdivided into water, energy, waste and green purchasing and corporate social responsibility. Um, I'll just give you an example that the kitchen is the highest energy using department in the hotel, therefore the executive chef is the head of the energy team. We try to meet once every two months for about an hour, we keep it short so that it doesn't become boring and too much of a chore um, and we set out goals on what we want to achieve. Um, how did we achieve carbon neutral certification? We worked with Green Hospitality Programme with the National Resource for Sustainable and Responsible Tourism in Ireland, recognised by governmental authorities including Fodge Ireland, Tourism Ireland, Discover Ireland and the SEAI. Uh, certification included several visits, creating a five-year energy efficiency plan, and finally being assessed and in our case awarded the carbon neutral 12 green mark certification and we're now the only premises in Ireland recognised as having achieved the certification. So I mentioned already that we have a 50 foot polytunnel and um, we grow about 6,000 euro produce there per year. It also uh, having homegrown produce reduces the mileage from suppliers and also um, means that there's less waste going in the bin because we pick the food as we need it. And it's also a nice story to tell on our, men on our menu. We have a bar eco barn uh, waiting and events venue that was built in 2018. And capacity is 300 for weddings. And we also hold a number of music events there. It's A rated, 100% soundproof. It's got all LED lights and it's got an extremely energy efficient heating and ventilation system. And the bar counter is made from old whiskey barrels and the lampshades are made from old fishermen's eel baskets from County Sligo. Um, and that's a picture over there on the bottom left. So as purchasing manager at the hotel, whenever we need to buy something new, I don't just necessarily replace it with whatever we used to do before. So for example, our wedding brochure used to be the, like a plastic lanyard that you'd get at a festival and we replaced it with an FSC cardboard one. Same thing with our do not disturb signs. They were paper. We changed them to a, a wooden handmade one. And actually one of our chefs does a bit of carpentry on the side. So he did it and it was good for him to have something uh, involvement in another way. Um, it's important to tell your story to the guests. So that's a picture of the sign in our cafe and explaining that if you arrive on your bicycle, you get a free tea or coffee. Uh, you get 30 cents off if you bring your own keep cup. 
and we don't sell any plastic bottles in the hotel, it's glass or cans. And if you arrive by bicycle, you get 10% off your overnight stay as well. We do a lot of fundraising. Unfortunately, 2020 wasn't a great year for it. But uh, between November 2017 and uh, 2019, we raised 23,457 euro. Um, we tried to do staff outings, like we climb mount, number of mountains and raise money for different, uh, try, to, try to do it for local charities. That's a picture of the map to show the local producers on our glass restaurant menu. Um, so it shows that we're supporting local suppliers. There's an abundance of really brilliant suppliers in our area. And it's important to tell your message to the guests as well. So for every wedding that we host, we plant 10 native trees per wedding. So in the last three years, we've planted 2,060 trees through an organization called hometree.ie. They're planted locally. And each tree offsets one ton of carbon in its lifetime. And the average age that the trees will go to are 70 years of age, years, years. And so that's a picture of some of the team members out planting. And sometimes the couples like to go out and plant the trees as well. Um, so I mentioned that um, we don't sell any plastic bottles. We have a refill station in the garden and in our rooms, we have a glass bottle that's reusable. We're involved with the community in terms of uh, doing village cleanups. We clean a hedgerow annually. And there's a team of 90 employees, most of whom are from the local community. We're the largest employer in North Clare. And we have a staff wellness initiative called Smiling on the Inside. It includes uh, staff and family memberships, the local swimming pool and gym, um, uh, free weekly yoga classes, monthly staff outings, and uh, nutritional consultation and a healthy staff menu. Now, of course, with COVID, things are different, but these are the normal practice of the hotel. Um, we host a number of festivals. We don't call them Hotel Doolan festivals. We call them the Doolan Writers Weekend, uh, Doolan Surf Fest, Doolan Folk Festival, uh, because it, in, it increases the involvement with the community. That's a picture of the one of the local ladies painting the logo and program on the wall um, at the venue. So we used to get all of the programs printed and uh, by painting the programs on the wall and sending them by email and people doing a screenshot of it, it saved printing 10,000 programs, um, which was a positive change. We've won a number of awards, including the uh, Bean Award for the Best Medium Sized Organization of the Year 2018 and 2019. They're listed below. Um, we didn't actually enter any awards in 2020 because we focused on our certification uh, to become carbon neutral. So in terms of water, some examples of how we reduce our water. Uh, we harvest rainwater for use in the polytunnel and cleaning. Um, we have hippo bags in the toilet cisterns. So for anybody that doesn't know what they are, they basically take up some space in the cistern for flushes. So you're using less water. We changed our heating system from oil to an air to water heating system. And that has re resulted in a 68% decrease in oil, we segregate waste in all departments and um, portion control and ordering of food and training is really essential. So I put in a table here that um, shows the statistics. I didn't put in 2020 figures because I felt that it wasn't a fair reflection because obviously um, our energy and water and waste have reduced. So um, I just wanted to show a more, um, a kind of more similar year. So. Between 2017 and 2019, our occupancy increased by 6% um, occupancy. And you can see that our electricity went up slightly by 14%. However, we changed our electricity to green electricity, which is a really simple change for any business to, to do by calling your electricity supplier. And it means that it's a zero carbon footprint. Um, we So even though our electricity and our occupancy went up, you'll see the CO2 tonnes reduced by 75%. And um, so our carbon footprint came down. And so in 2017, you'll see CO2 tons. Uh, it was 465 ton of carbon that was generated for running the hotel that year. By changing to green electricity and by changing the heating system and by um, putting energy charts into the, the hotel. So to turn on equipment at specific times, we reduced it to 114 ton. And then we offset that carbon through the planting of the trees. So um, examples of some of the positive changes that we did during the 
pandemic so far. Uh, the top left is a picture of one of the wood pellet stoves that we purchased. So we increased the outdoor space uh, for dining outdoors in the garden and we purchased six of these. Um, so the wood pellets, again, there's no there's no um, carbon generated from running those. Uh, we're very involved in the Burn Eco Tourism Network and that's a group of about 60 businesses in the Geopark. And um, the, the Burn Eco Tourism Network won the award for Best in Travel 2021. Uh, during, the first, during the first lockdown, some of the staff um, volunteered and delivered meals to over a thousand uh, local, vulnerable and elderly people in the community. Um, so then the bottom right picture is just a picture of one of the staff members out, you know, delivering that meal. So we try to use our time um, as well as possible during the pandemic. And our five year plan, we're committed to planting 10 trees per wedding. We've got no expiry on that. We will continue to do it. We've one holiday home that currently runs on oil. We'll be changing that to biomass. Um, we've got plans for generating electricity through PV. Um, solar panels, we will continue to purchase green electricity and we're going to do a feasibility study on generating uh, wind energy. We'll be purchasing a food composter and um, we have a field beside the hotel so we'll hopefully be doing something in terms of biodiversity. So um, yeah, we, we're going to continue our green journey and keep pushing the boat out further. Uh, so that's it from me. Uh, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to present. Thanks very much Anya and now we're going to hand over to David. David, thank you very much. Thanks, Anya. Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, let's get this up here now. Just listening to listening to Anya there, I mean, it's 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 in, it's it's unbelievably impressive what they've done down there. Um, you know, it's it, you learn something new every day. It's every day is a day in school. But I mean, some of the stuff they've done is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I think I'll you know, be making a phone call to Anya after this. You know, certainly the stuff that we've uh, we've learned. Um, so even I thought we have solar panels here, we have motion detected lighting um, and a few things like that in the hotel. But um, when it comes to the other matters, you know, it's, 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 it's incredible what they've done down there. So my name is uh, David McCoy. So I'm the general manager of Stranded Lodge and Suites. Uh, this is our 10th year as um, an operation as a hotel. We've won um, numerous awards in relation to um, hospitality. And we've always felt that uh, where we're situated, we're situated in one of the most scenic, beautiful parts of uh, Ireland. And we've always sought to be in a, a type of part of the community. So uh, with that in mind, my presentation this evening is basically around uh, Strand Hill Community Development Association, who won uh, the European Destination of Excellence Award um, in 2019. Now, I was just prior to 2020, so um, look, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of a snapshot in time, but it certainly gives an idea, and certainly listen to, to John there and Anya, that the way forward, I think, when this we get out of this uh, pandemic will be that um, sustainability will be the way forward for businesses, and businesses who can, who can last and come out of this, I think, will be very important. Uh, so the slide there just shows two quick things there. So you see the Go Strand Hill there at the very bottom. That's uh, our community website. It's basically, it's a tourism-based website, so it includes everything to do with uh, Strand Hill. That was, uh, the work over there is Strand Hill Moments, which is the hashtag for Strand Hill. And uh, Go Strand Hill itself is run by a local marketer, and um, it was a collaboration of the community and uh, Alan Mulroney, who is uh, a local marketer in the area as well. So it's a very successful site. So just going down to the next slide. Um, so, as I said, Strand Hill, to us anyway, is one of the most beautiful parts of Ireland. And I suppose for any of you who are, who are working from home, it there should be an advisory put on it that is so beautiful that you'd want to, you know, it kind of makes you feel sick sitting in your houses. But uh, it's, it's an area where we live. We're very, we're very proud of the area where we live. Um, and like Anya, you know, we're, we're very much based in the community and trying to, 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 trying to make, um, things work in the community as a whole. So um, the Strand Hill Community Development Association, we won the, the Pride of Place Award for Strand Hill um, back in 2015. And one of the exercises that that actually did was that we went through the community and we brought different actually, aspects of the community together. So this is like your um, sports and recreation, your community, your visitors, your religious people. Um, and what it kind of brought together is we kind of did a survey. And one of the amazing statistics that we discovered on that was that in that area there that you're looking at, there's over 800 people employed locally at the top of at the, at the height of the season, the summer season. 
and there are over 200 businesses registered in the Strand Hill area. That's uh, from the company's office. So that's incredibly statistic. And John Bartlett, who is our chairperson, is also working with uh, Sligo IT. They led a research paper, um, and on that research paper was to do with tourism and, tourism and sustainability. And they found that Strand Hill's particular success was, I suppose, marrying the local population with tourism, and it was a key factor in what makes it so special. So, for example, to give you a practical example, if I'm working here in the hotel, um, we don't have a bar restaurant here, but so we kind of use the restaurants and bars in the locality. So when tourists come in or visitors come in, they stay with us, they go next door. But when they go next door, there isn't, um, it isn't a visitor vibe, it's very much a local vibe. So when they go in there, you have a lot of locals at the bar counter, they're interacting with locals all the time. So we very much see that in order to build the tourism product, the community have to go with you. And I suppose that's where, that's where our whole um, ethos comes from. So this all came about like Strand Hill missed out on a special tourism status back in 2000, um, whereby that holiday homes were to be built to other areas. And at the time, the reason it wasn't built is because the beach is unsafe for swimming. But at the time, obviously, people were very upset that it didn't happen. But since then, because it, that there wasn't a lot of holiday homes built, it meant, meant that the village was allowed to grow naturally. So with that is where the tourism um, aspect comes in. That's how the, the success has grown. Um, so I suppose what would have been kind of a seen as a negative has turned out to be a positive. Just moving on to the next slide. So um, the Strand Hill Community Development Association. So we began in uh, 1991 and it was initially to address the planning concerns in the village. And its main, uh, I suppose its main reason to be was that uh, to secure community facilities and generally to improve the lives of residents. So um, it's seen as a rep representative voice of the village to local authorities, to county council. But what we've divided it up now into, <clears throat> into various subgroups. So the subgroups include biodiversity, include coastal erosion, include sustainable tourism. Uh, Aoife Porter from Google Marketing heads up that, the, your biodiversity by Susan Tynan. Uh, your eco warriors, Seamus McGoldrick. But we also have um, SEIA, um, uh, kind of a Strand Hill sustainable, sustainable Energy Community. So this is which I'll, I'll touch on later. But the idea is that to try and cover as many aspects of the village as we can to provide to the residents. And again, this feeds back into the tourism product. The tourism product. So I mentioned there already about Go Strand Hill. So this was founded um, from local business with local entrepreneur uh, Alan Mulroney. And this was the first online collaboration of businesses in the area. Um, I suppose it came from the idea of marketing together as an idea. So business funded the operation of it and is still into existence to this day. So if you go back to when it was founded, you know, especially when we opened first, you know, we, we you know, the, the area was quieter than it is now. But individual businesses, you, some of them, you know, people in the locality will know like uh, Voya, uh, Shell's Cafe, the Strand Bar, the venue, all these businesses individually excellent on their own. And ourselves, and that we all came together and said, well, look, it's time that we marketed the village as a whole. And uh, collaboration is key, I think, in any, any tourism uh, business or any, certainly to develop a, a, a region. So uh, moving on, so Strand Hill um, began promoting itself, I suppose, solely having respect for the local community and to assist this by drive, driving tourism as well as respecting the local landscape. So we did this by uh, having an objection of a sustainable tourism within the, within the village. So this is to, to kind of develop a cogent strategy, one that didn't focus on necessarily on the peak season, but rather on the shoulder season. So our, sustain, our sustainable tourism lady for Porter of Google Marketing, so she led workshops um, with local businesses who operate here and the local community to marry kind of a strategy that promotes the area, but also promotes it to the correct market. So this is using, again, on the slide you see there, that the connected family is social energizes, culturally curious. These are the buzzwords uh, that Fulch Ireland would use, and these are the kind of where by each category, each uh, demographic is divided in a particular category. Uh, we also had uh, workshops with uh, a good Claremont, Killian Murphy, that from Loop Head Tourism. Um, I know Anya had worked with him before as well. But just all these things to try and feed in, to try and see where we're going to take tourism product and how that, that, we, that we can bring a sustainable model, model of tourism to Strand Hill that won't um, impact too much on the local community or that the local community will willingly come along with it. So I suppose the promotion of the area was to focus on natural environment. Uh, so this was through preservation and promotion as well. So we worked in collaboration with Sligo Lead and with Sligo County Council. Uh, they developed new walking trails. Uh, some of the local landowners had to give up land again, so that's the community aspect of it again. 
um, and then surfing and obviously the natural environment as well. So all these things came over the last 10 years to try and develop Strand Hill as a product, or not necessarily as a product, but as a destination that people would go. So very, focusing very much on the outdoors aspect of it. And within that, um, to do the sustainable models that people, when they visit here, that they would do so in a, in a respectful way. So it's, um, so again, uh, with the community health and well-being. so I suppose being part of the community, the aspect uh, of sport and recreation. So promotion of local sport, sports clubs and facilities, local volunteer surf club. Um, all this is about, I suppose, this is our development association, assisting with um, local initiatives, like for example, the surf club, they have an hour of power there, that's in the community. Um, you know, 200 kids on a Sunday morning, all volunteers go out learning how to surf. Um, you know, protection and promotion of local facilities. So some of the community uh, groups that lead with us, who work with us very closely to promote the product. You know, you have the surf club, we have Strand Celtic, and, and Mick will be talking about that within a few moments. Uh, you have the golf club, you have the GEA, the Calera GEA, the Warriors Committee, who run the, the Warriors run, those of you in the Northwest will know that. Uh, yoga clubs, fitness for all. So it's, it's, a, it's a plethora of, of clubs who are all based within the community, all based with businesses, all working together for the betterment of the area. Um, and I suppose this is success with the next one coming up here. So you have Boya Seaweed Bath. So again, I suppose the, the, one of the flag bearers of the region uh, are the Boya Seaweed Baths. And this is one of the great success stories of Strand Hills. So it's Neil and uh, Mick were the two founders, Neil and, and God the good to him, Mick has, has passed on since. But they were the founder of Boya Seaweed Baths uh, in around the year 2000. And now they've diversified into Boya products and you'll find those products all over the world. But this is based upon their model of uh, using the, the, the landscape, um, you know, for, uh, you know, in order to develop the seaweed baths. Um, they're the very personification of, I suppose, marrying the natural environment with business and promotion and preservation of the natural environment. And Neil, of course, is also involved in the local seal rescue as well. So you can find Neil not only surfing and harvesting seaweed, but also rescuing seals as well. So, you know, you have all aspects in the community. So again, this aspect of marrying the land and sea, Seamus Bogoldick is one of our members. Uh, so Seamus, for example, runs beach cleans. Uh, he gets when he runs surf camps there, he gets them to do beach cleans as well. So again, this is teaching the, the, the younger people to have respect for their, you know, respect for their environment. And, you know, that's very, very important as work as well. And this all marries back into us again for the promotion of tourism was the Wide Atlantic Way uh, aspect as well. So the Wide Atlantic Way for us was a game changer in terms of a marketing event that it brought people um, more to the northwest than the, the kind of strategic area it used to be of kind of a line between uh, Gov between Galway and Dublin and everything about that. So tourism is beginning to grow, and I think the Wild Atlantic Way brand has been you know has been instrumental in this, and it's, it's certainly one of the one of the one of the best things to come in the area. So again, um, I suppose one of the reasons that we won the European Destination of uh, Excellence Awards was to focus on uh, the community and businesses working together to protect the local environment. So again. This is uh, work with local engineers, walking, working on the walking trails. Uh, but also the other aspect of it was um, our biodiversity committee. So as I mentioned at the start, some of the biodiversity, we have a biodiversity subcommittee. So again, this subcommittee works on, uh, it's you know, to enhance and protect the biodiversity of Strand Hill, to contribute to the sustainable development of the village, collaborate with tourism stakeholders. And then in this area, we have different a biodiversity action plan and this was all I suppose pre-pandemic but uh, it's still in the pipeline to be done so this biodiversity action plan will then um, impact on how for example you see the sand dunes there how those are going to be impacted in the future as well so um, that's very important as well so again the education of the local people you know things like uh, the pollinator program uh, things like not getting the locals not to mow your lawn until a certain time of the year not to cut down certain things uh, at different times to protect the bees, the bird life. So again, all this we find as a development association, very, very important to the lives of the people, but also to the community. And again, this is encouraged here in the hotel, but encouraged the businesses around the village as well, that people visiting the area, that they do have knowledge of biodiversity as well. And I suppose at this stage, the other aspect as well is the, um, we've created a, um, we create a kind of a, an SEAI, uh, which is a kind of a sustainable energy community as well. So I went on a bit further on that. Um, so the SEIA working group, um, the idea of that is to, to kind of 
to gain a comprehensive understanding of how energy use within buildings, not just commercial buildings, but residential buildings as well. Again, this is informing the community of um, efficient choices available, taking steps to increase biodiversity, as mentioned, supporting homeowners, community groups. Um, the whole end of this is to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, what we're doing as well is that we're one of the first communities in the country, I think, to actually get um, a partnership with the County Council to, 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 to conduct an energy audit of all the locality. So this will be uh, the different housing estates, for example, one house within one of the housing estates will get an energy audit and that will give a, an indication of uh, the energy use of the rest of that estate. Again, a selection of a couple of businesses will do the same thing as well. This is in order to inform us on how our energy is being used and that you know, can inform the community on, on changes that we can make in the future as well. So again, um, moving on to the future there as well. So as part of the 2000-2014, uh, 2013-2014, the Maritime Company, which is another aspect of the Strand Hill community, the Maritime Company looks after uh, the surf centre on the seafront. Um, so we, um, a group of Maritime Company, which consists of local county councillors, consists of community representatives and uh, council officials as well, that they, um, look after the management of the surf centre, of, of the old surf centre on the seafront. So in 2000-2014 we looked about trying to increase the um, size of the surf club and that was done. We, um, it was it, the subcommittee of that, uh, was, Mick was heavily involved as well, as well as Derek Parrell from the, from the surf club and myself, we, we were huddled up in uh, a room for two days filling out a fault chart and application um, for, for their capital project, which happened around 2016. And in that, um, we kind of, I suppose, serendipitously, serendipitously, it kind of happened around the same time that, that that came out because we were planning to expand. So only five, I suppose, five years later, but uh, this is going to be the newest National Surfing Centre of Excellence. And again, this is uh, designed with all modern eco, um, all the eco, I suppose, aspects are going to be included in that as well rainwater harvesting, you know, um, carbon neutral energy kind of, um, as well. So I mean, this is another aspect, I suppose, of how the village is going to move into the future. They'll also have new changing facilities, a community space, surfing centre as well for training, and then an interpretive centre as well, which is going to include um, the marrying, I suppose, of the, the land and the sea, and then uh, you know, the history of surfing in Ireland as well. So look, Strandhill is one of the most beautiful parts of the world, as I said. Um, the Eden Awards, the European Destination of Excellence Award, is about recognising an area where the local community are invested in the local product. I suppose one of the criticisms in days gone past was about people in Sligo. I've often heard it, certainly at tourism meetings, about not being friendly and uh, kind of inward looking. I think that's no more. And I think that uh, the different campaigns Sligo Tourism run have definitely changed the, 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 the facade of, or the, the way that Sligo was perceived. I think Strandhill is a microcosm of that, and it's the microcosm of the wider county. And Sligo is a terrific tourism destination now. And speaking only of Strandhill, we believe in fostering relationships. And this is what this award is about, what the Development Association is about. It's about believing, fostering relationships to the betterment of the locals that live here, but also recognizing, I suppose, that um, you know that the business has to be done as well. So this is the just the, the award ceremony that was. So that's just the, the Development Association, and that's with Falch Ireland as well. So um, I suppose with that, it brings to the end of mine. I'm sorry if I went a bit over time, um, and I just uh, pass you on to uh, Mick. Sorry, we are running a bit over time. So if Mick doesn't mind, we'll um, kick off with him, if that's OK. I hope people are OK for another few, 10 minutes of that. Yeah, you always squeeze me at the end. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and shoot through it. There's some duplication with, uh, with David's slides, so I'll, I'll run through it. I think we all agree. So I go on Strand Hill is one of the most beautiful places we can we can visit. So let me let me go through. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, Strand Hill Community Park. I say my name is Mick McEnroe. I'm development officer at Strand Celtic, and uh, working closely with the uh, trustees of Strand Hill Community Park. So uh, just uh, let me keep going. So a little bit of Strand Hill, we have about 7,000 people in the uh, West Ligo area. Uh, it's one of the uh, largest growing areas with uh, forecasts going up to 9,000 by 2023. It's a major tourism hub, which you all know, and the Eden Award, David went through. So the Strand Hill Community Park is located on the airport road for people that know it. It's located right in the heart of the community. 
It's held in trust uh, for the community by the trustees, and it's managed and run by Strand Celtic FC, which is one of the largest uh, amateur soccer uh, clubs in the Northwest. A lot of different organizations use it, uh, including the Strand Hill uh, Carvin Park, Warriors Festival, music groups, active age groups, um, people with disabilities, mental health. So it's widely used and has become a major uh, amount of growth in, in the last 10 years. Uh, back in 2003, the park was in very bad shape. There was rocks coming up. It couldn't really be used for a lot of sports activities. So we put a, um, a six phase plan together uh, over 10 years. And that started with the development of the playing surface and making into two uh, premium football pitches. We also built a new clubhouse with additional dressing rooms. We installed floodlights uh, because we needed uh, more capacity to hold events. And we also developed a, a, an AstroTurf multi-use facility. Uh, we developed a car park and we also built, installed uh, two playgrounds all costing in the region of 1.2 million. And I also want to acknowledge the support of Sligo Leader Partnership, Sligo County Council, Sligo Tourism with Sligo Caravan and Camping, and the Sports Capital, which is Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Celtic, Sports and Media for helping with the funding, um, which was about 70% of, of the total fund. We then put a new plan together, another uh, seven phase plan from to bring us from 2013 to 2023. So we, phase one was increased storage. We continued to improve the, the football pitches. We upgraded the playgrounds. We put a community walkway around the outside of the park. And then at the heart of it, which I, I go into a little bit more detail is the development of an eco-friendly park. Um, we're still continuing to work and we're in the process of uh, applying for funding for grounds equipment. And we're also going to look at extending the, the main clubhouse and add a gymnasium. Um, current phase is one to four, we're talking about, about 300,000 um, euro. So the eco park, so it's, it's clear we're all in agreement that all communities have a responsibility to play the part, to protect the environment. Uh, and Strand Celtic want to be, you know, a flagship club to do that. And we want to make sure that we have you know, more um, sustainable use of water resources, improve renewable energy, minimize waste, and become an environmental leader. We, we take a model from Forest Green Rovers in the UK, and they have, have pioneered this, this whole um, principle. So, so we want to turn uh, Strand Hill Community Park into an environmentally friendly uh, park and Strand Celtic as a green club. So again, I'd like to acknowledge those uh, organizations that are supporting us in this. So starting with rainwater harvesting, water is a, is a precious resource. Uh, trying to keep two uh, full-size soccer pitches uh, drained and, and, and fed and watered is, is, is very demanding. So what we decided to do is we needed to capture the rainwater so we can use it in time when the rare times it doesn't rain in Ireland. Um, but it's in the summertime, it's, uh, you're surprised how many days that there's no rain. Uh, so we installed a uh, rainwater harvesting system that, that captured the rain from the main buildings. We, we installed 30,000 litre tanks to, to capture that water and store it. And uh, we also, when we were doing it, we replaced uh, an ancient foul water storage system that was there with septic tanks. And we connected into, into uh, the, the main system. Uh, we also have plans uh, to put a water filling station to discourage use of single use plastics. We were the first club in, of, any, of any type in the country to um, ban the use of, of plastic bottles and high energy drinks. So if, if any kid arrives and we have over 400 kids playing in the club with a plastic bottle with a Lucas A sport or whatever, seeing they're, they're using it uh, to force to uh, throw it out and and filter, filter bottle uh, full of water. So solar power, the objective of this is to convert the majority of the power requirements over to solar uh, energy. Uh, so we needed capacity to, uh, to support a 
lighting of the clubhouse to lighting of the walkways, training lights, security lighting, scoreboards, and other power sources. So the only, the only system that we don't have under um, solar power is the main floodlights. And that's because uh, they just consume too much energy and we haven't quite mastered that one yet. But the PV panels that we've put on the roof have a peak output of 6.4 kilowatt and have uh, 9.6 kilowatt of uh, battery storage. So the, uh, that's picture there of the, the solar and uh, we have it internet based monitoring of the system. So we're also using the, the solar energy to, we converted all the lighting over to low energy LED lighting. Uh, so we, we, um, we were doing the community walkway and we replaced all the lighting and we put all the LED lighting, the spectator area, the stand is a 200 seater stand recently um, um, installed. They all have been converted to LED lighting. And so, and, and we're continuing to work on putting a system in place for the main flood lighting for the pitch, which is the only remaining thing to be solar powered. Uh, from an um, energy um, um, friendly transport, uh, we installed a bicycle shelter. So we're encouraging kids to bring their bicycles and walk and not to be brought, brought by their parents uh, down um, that is, you know, we're centrally located. So we're encouraging our, our, all, the, all the kids and people who use the park uh, to cycle. And the community walkway is, is, is open to encourage people that when they're down in the park and the kids are playing in the playground, they can go for a walk around the park, which is, which is great. It's all nice and protected and safe. Waste management is obviously a very important thing. We have objective to reduce and, and, and reuse and recycle. Um, as a public park, we had a lot of users would bring in their waste, waste down to dump it into the park, into our bins. So we made that a lot more difficult now. Um, but our new bin system uh, that we have is, is for uh, separating the waste into both the waste that is generated inside the building and outside. The new park um, recycling center is installed um, for, for recyclable and general waste. And the new waste management in the clubhouse is for separation prior to collection. And we've also um, brought in uh, no disposables, all reusable plastic bottle um, to help reduce uh, plastic bottles. So the Eco Park Recycling Center is part of it and we're working closely with Repac. Repac will join their green, uh, Team Green so we've gotten recognition as a community park and the facilities are only one part of it. Partnership with Repac is to provide improved information. Uh, we're, we're promoting their Team Green initiative and we're putting information signs and none of them have started to be erected. And we've been providing uh, environmental awareness um, to all our members through our online uh, communication clubs app management system. So summary. Uh, we're pioneering um, not just sustainable tourism at our park and, and in the area, and but uh, Strand Celtic uh, is at the heart of that. Our community park has seen a huge increase in usage. Um, our Strand, our club and, and trustees, we have a track record of delivering on projects on time and in budget, and that's why we've continued to be awarded funding to do this. Our eco park moves the park to a sustainable energy using solar power, rainwater, and LED lighting, and, uh, and also um, working closely with Repac. Um, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Mick, thanks a million. And I'd like to thank all our panelists. We're getting great compliments on your role and everybody's comment, um, um, complimenting the um, content and all of that. Um, I suppose it's just one or two quick questions. Anya, the one in for you, if there was one takeaway that you'd advise if someone was thinking of going down the green route, what would it be? Or what would you recommend? Um, the one thing that I would say is if you're doing any new bills, uh, put, in, uh, rain, put in tanks for harvesting rainwater. When we were building the barn, we had four months to build it to replace the marquee. And it was... Um, was a regret that we didn't put in tanks. So that's one thing. And um, yeah, it's important to have the team on board with you. So like for it not to be a chore um, and to get there, like some of your team will have just brilliant ideas and 
it has definitely helped us with um, reducing employee turnover and they're the two things that I'd say about that, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry. Um, John, there was just a question in there. For any kind of business, you know, even in the accountancy world, what would you recommend them starting to do to look at their, you know, policy if there's no green policy in a practice at the moment? Well, that's a good question. There's, there's lots of great examples, and we've heard we've heard three of them already this evening. Uh, but I mean, I and I, I think I'd echo Onia's comments about talking to employees first, because really the employees have such such a wealth of uh, information and good ideas, and want to be part of the solution. Um, but I think if you're starting from ground zero, you really need to take a step back and think about well, what's important to this particular business? There's so many different things under economic, environmental, and social. You could quickly be overwhelmed by it. It's just a wall of information, even just on climate change. So really stand back and think, well, what are the top three areas that we're going to focus on? And then be really good at doing those three things and ignore the other things. Even if people say, well, we'd really like you to do this and the other, ignore them and really focus on the three things that are going to be where you can make the most impact as a business, but will benefit your business as well. And I think it was on you mentioned it, you've got to keep your eye on the bottom line profitability there's no point being a sustainable business if you're going out of business so you have to maintain uh, an, a financial perspective and this is why bringing accountants into this equation is so critical at this point in time five years ago accountants wouldn't have been in this conversation because sustainability yeah. was something a little office did down the corner now it's mainstream yeah, um, I know there are a couple of questions in there about what they could be doing in budgets and all of that and um, different, um, and I know you've answered some of them, Susan, as well, in relation to um, the chartered accountant and whether, um, sorry, what was the question there now? I can't even read it now myself. Um, the counting standards, whether it'd be a soft approach or that, but if you want to elaborate on that, Susan. Or Hi. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. The question I think was, um, were, what were going to be the main drivers I think, for sustainability? Was it going to be policy? Was it going to be standards? And my answer to the question was that it's going to be a, a multiplicity of factors. So I think one of the main, uh, certainly policy, is policy makers are now the, kind of the principal drivers of change. And only yesterday, the Sustainable Finance Directive um, have uh, is now become, become law um, across Europe where investors or people who are creating products, uh, financial products will have to uh, disclose information about the sustainability of these to, kind of, to remove the threat of greenwashing or the risk of their, their being kind of yeah, greenwashing only. Um, however, there's an awful lot more than just pure policy. Uh, it's a hugely consumer driven area. And so people will find that their, their requirements to embrace sustainability is not just a policy. It's also a multitude of stakeholders from their board uh, from consumers, from uh, from say, their mm. clients and, and also their staff. And mm. so Sonia and John have referenced it's, and the importance of staff in all of this. Um, in terms of accounting standards, I think that's something the accounting standards are more reflecting what the investors are requiring, which is why there's been such a drive um, just in 2020 alone um, for consolidation uh, and comparability among the, the different accounting standards and why we're, we're responding to consultations on that. Currently, I mean, they're, at the moment, the IFRS are still looking at creating their own sustainability reporting standards. So this is very much a case of watch the space. Okay, perfect. And then there's just a question in there then. Um, do you see a role for development associations and cooperatives in offshore wind? David or Mick, if you'd like to take that or, or how are you with your offshore wind? I'm, I wouldn't be very au fait on the offshore wind. I, I, I've been known to talk a lot of the time, but not uh, an offshore. Um, I suppose rather than rather than going on the houses, um, I don't know, but um, certainly it's something I, I, I'd obviously love to get um, more knowledge about and certainly you know, mm -hmm. if, if there's a way that we could do it, then absolutely, you know, unless Mick has more information. Uh, I, I don't, David. I, I've, I'll stay on land. Um, <laughs> like myself, so... If we could harness a, a wave power, it would be, we, we would, we would uh, power the country. Uh, exactly. Probably okay. some conversations we have to have with John and Anya, I think, anyway, as a group, I think, we to point us in the right direction. I, I think the cost of onshore and the risk associated might be beyond a, a local association, to be perfectly honest with you. That is true. That is true. That is true. 
Okay, look, I know we've ran seriously over time, but I'd like to thank you all. You've been very good. And um, I know there's a lot of questions there, so we'll formulate them and we'll get them out. And if anybody would like the slides, um, I'm sure we can arrange that as well. And um, so again, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out. You've been very good and um, it's been a very informative uh, webinar. And um, so again, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good night. Enjoy, enjoy your night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.